oh no, we can't have this. Come along with me and I'll tell you about our predator problems. Hi everyone and welcome back to Homestead Rewind. The tomatoes are getting larger and larger and they're growing higher up on the vine. I've been able to let the chickens back out of their lockdown stage because they can't reach these um, to peck at them. They try to fly up, but they never can get to them. It's kind of funny to watch. One day last week, we lost my two beautiful olive egg roosters to a predator. And also, we had a break-in into the outdoor kitchen. I had left the window uh, open in the kitchen, and that's where I store my cat food, luckily in a five-gallon close-up container. And a raccoon literally broke into the screen and busted into the outdoor kitchen and literally tried to chew the lid off of this five gallon bucket. In the process, it broke a light bulb, tore the whole place up because it was trying to figure out how to get back out. And I had a TV setting in there, it knocked the TV over. And when I brought the TV out into the light, I could see very distinct raccoon prints. So that's how I solved the mystery of who broke into the outdoor kitchen. The break-in that killed my two olive acre roosters happened in our new hut. When we were putting this hut together, we simply forgot to cover a part of it. Let me show you. So this area was pretty plush with the actual um, roof, but as time has gone by, and I've had the water bucket, and you can see I have it hanging, and filling it up, it's caused it to rearrange some, and just enough room for what I think is a raccoon to get in here. You can see the dry blood where it pulled the chickens back out. There was absolutely nothing left of the chickens, only just a few of the down feathers. No beaks, no feet, nothing. And it's really hard for us to believe that a raccoon got down in there and was able to get back out with a whole chicken. There were 18 chickens in here and it killed, over the course of two nights, it killed two of my olivega roosters which is really sad because I was looking forward to breeding them back this spring and getting some more olive egg chickens. Now I'm just going to have to start all over again with the roosters. Never a dull moment on the homestead. So we're in the process of trying to discover what it is that's getting into the coop. I no longer are cooping the chickens up in there. Uh, since those two big roosters are gone, everybody's getting along in the bigger pen, which is way more secure. Um, we're going to have to get the time together and figure out how we're going to put that, get that spot covered up. But in the meantime, my son brought me over a live trap. And we set it up, and the first couple of nights we didn't catch anything. But last night, we caught it. He looks awfully cute, and he seems awfully calm. I'm not going to mess with it, though, until Jay gets over here. I think we'll probably take him and turn him loose down at the river. Hi, little guy. He just seems so tame, doesn't he? Got a little tick on its ear. I don't dare stick my hand over there. I know what will happen. Maybe I can catch some footage when Jay takes him and loads him up to take him down to the river. It occurs to me that I've never really explained to you guys what I mean when I'm talking about an olive egg. These are the eggs that are laid by the olive egg or chickens. This is an egg that's laid by a wellsummer. If I'm remembering correctly, my breeder told me that he crossbred a wellsummer hen with a copper, a black copper moran rooster to get these dark colored, dark green colored eggs. And I do have some of the black copper morans, but they haven't started laying yet. When I do, I'll show them to you. They're a very, very dark and beautiful egg. I don't know if the camera's going to show it the way it is in person. Setting them side by side, you can see the different shades and how much darker these are. Another problem that's surfaced around the farm lately is the squash bugs. I intentionally planted all of my squash later on in the year. And though they're not as bad as I've seen them when I tried to grow squash in years past, um, I still am having a few of them. And I'm finding that I have to come out here twice a day 
and li I'm literally just cutting the whole leaf off. If I find the little nits or the little eggs on there, I'm cutting those leaves off and burning them, just getting rid of them. But also I'm going through and I'm killing every single one of those little bugs that I see. One of the advantages to having this gravel base around all of my plants is when there's a cluster of them, I can just shake the, the vine and they fall into that gravel and then I just roll the gravel around and it kills those bugs. It's pretty easy, especially when they're really tiny because they, they start out really tiny. That method seems to be working. My plants are still thriving and I'm still getting squash on. As long as I can stay on top of that two or three times a day, then I think it's going to be all right. There are tons and tons of insects since we brush hogged the field. They've all just came over to my garden. Creatures I've never even seen before. These guys look like wasps. And they look like their sting could be deadly. They're pollinating my spearmint. I am absolutely loving my zinnias. They're my favorite flower to grow. I think I got that from my grandmother. She always had zinnias. And I got a late start this year because I was so concerned about getting vegetables in the garden. But here they are. You can plant them late and they'll make pretty fall colors. Speaking of fall colors. I love spring for its wildflowers, but you gotta love fall too. Look at all of those insects on that goldenrod. It's almost time for me to get that harvested and try to make some medicinal tinctures out of it.